Hi everyone, it's Victoria here, and welcome to the podcast. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know about the free courses the Victoria Stowell Academy has available to enroll in right now for dog geeks like you. Just go to vsdogtrainingacademy.com and click the enroll button, and you'll see the free course options. That's vsdogtrainingacademy.com. See you there. On the podcast today, I have two of my favorite people. I am so blessed to know Lisa and Brad Wagner from Cold Nose College. And they are not only amazing trainers in their own right, but they're also faculty for VSA and faculty advisors as well for our VSA students. They are an amazing, I call them the dynamic duo because they truly are incredible. I've learned so much from them and you're going to learn a lot from them too. If, well, we're very lucky because both of them are going to be presenting at the Dog Behavior Conference this year on Rocket Recall, which is, I think, the most important thing to teach any dog is to how to come back when, when they're called. But they're just, I have so many questions to ask them because they are really, if you want to learn about dogs and you want to learn about what it's like to be an educator and how to do it, it's from Lisa and Brad. So both of you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. We'll try to be worthy of that, Victoria. <laughs> it's always fun to be here and, and talk dog stuff. I met you, how long ago was it? About 10 years ago now? Close to 10 years, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yes. And weirdly enough, you know my brother-in-law, which was just coincidence mm -hmm. because All you're world. kayakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we spend a lot of time with your brother-in-law, Flip Hager. Many yeah. 30 some years ago, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is just shocking. We and babies. then we were babies. Yeah. I was 10. <laughs> <laughs> so young. We're all so young. Uh, and you, and I met you because that's when we were developing um, VSA and we had heard so many great things about you. And we knew that you would be great teachers and you are indeed great teachers. And you have taught in the in-person intensives, both in America and in the UK as well as you know any any anybody who comes to learn at VSA will get to know you very well you do a load of the lessons a load of the cyber classes and you also faculty advisors to a lot of our online students so first of all before we go into rocket recall and geek out on dog training can you tell us a little bit about your story on how you became dog trainers sure yeah um it started with me and there's, there's a little in, in the book, uh, the original Rocket Recall, I talk about this a little bit. I mean, it was the death of a dog that propelled me into dog training. No, didn't propel me into dog training. The death of a dog caused me to want to learn more about dogs. I had had an Australian Shepherd that was two and a half. I had just learned about six or eight months prior to his death about positive reinforcement training. I have had trained him the old fashioned way. We oh my gosh, the epiphany of, of, I don't have to hurt my dog to trade my dog and it can be this easy and I've got amazing buy-in from this amazing creature in front of me. Um, I had just experienced that feeling and then he was, he was tragically killed. And after I kind of clawed myself out of a, a deep depression, um, I said, you know, I'm gonna learn that there's a, I would want to help people learn there's another way to train dogs. I want to, you know, gather some professional education to help maybe my local shelter, maybe my family members. I never intended to be a, a, a dog trainer, but, you know, look where I am today. Knowledge is never wasted. And it took me in a whole new career. I left my executive search business behind, jumped into dog training in a few years um, after teaching group classes locally. Um, Brad joined. Yeah, I was the guy who carried the boxes in and out, you know, when she was doing the training. And I sort of started getting some of it through osmosis, maybe. Um, and then when the economy tanked, our other day jobs, if you will, kind of went away. So we took out a sizable small business loan and opened a training center. And the, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. I started my formal education then as well. And it's just evolved over the years to what it is now. 
the fun part, you, you alluded to it earlier you know, through our whitewater kayaking is how we knew your brother-in-law, Flip. We taught whitewater kayaking together. We were certified whitewater kayak instructors, and we enjoy teaching, uh, team teaching together. So it was just a natural evolution to move into the, the business of uh, working with dogs and their people. You're so good at it, too. This team, when when you come as a team, and I know some, and, and you obviously you do work separately as well, but you're so good at it. It's almost like you know what the other's thinking and you know when to pick up. And that's scary sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, it's 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 something that that you know we've we're lucky to have. It's it's something that just happens naturally between us, and perhaps it's because. You know, we we have such a, a a wonderful marriage and wonderful relationship, and we you know how do relationships get built by spending time with one another? We're fortunate that throughout the decades that we've been married, we've we've grown together. We enjoy the same things. We do things together, and we can finish each other's sentences sometimes, even when it's outside of dog training. So I think it's just it's it comes naturally to us. Um, Brad's, both Brad's parents were teachers in some way. Um, my dad was not, but he was a clinical psychologist, PhD in clinical psychology. So we both embraced, we both embraced learning theory and how that makes a difference. Learning theory is, right? It's happening all the time. And we do come at things from different directions, which kind of makes yeah. it, we're not in lockstep per se, but, you know, we have the same foundation, but yet coming at the picture from different angles. And I think that that's helpful. And we can bounce ideas off, off of one another, which is really, really nice. Like, gosh, you know, I'm thinking about this, how, you know, or I'm working with Keaton, you know, one of my dogs, do you see something that may be happening? That being said, having two dog trainers under one roof <laughs> with one dog can sometimes be uh, entertaining, shall we say. <laughs> Very entertaining. <laughs> Um, you have made the journey, I should say, but when you first started, as you were saying, Lisa, when you first started, you know, things were way more punitive than they are now. I mean, obviously you're sort of, we're, we're all in beautiful synchronized step with each other when it comes to positive training. But can you tell us, a, tell me a little bit about that evolution? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really sad for me to think about, um, I think for any of us who have trained with aversive in, aversives in the past, um, when we think about what we may have, the pain or the discomfort we may, may have caused to our, or an, stress or, or stress uh, to our animals, then it's hard not to feel guilty about that. But yet I didn't know anything different at the time. So what's really important is to not judge myself or not judge anyone else for, for being told that you need to do X, Y, or Z um, to help train your dog. Yeah, we were simply doing what the trainer said we needed to do. And we were following instructions. Um, fortunately, we never taught those methods. Right. We, we were taught those methods and we used those and we learned early them. on. But we never... You, taught those to dog owners. Uh, by the time Lisa had discovered positive reinforcement, we had made that shift uh, ourselves with our dogs. But the first, the first thing that caused us to go or caused me, and then Brad saw it too, like, I don't think Abby is happy. So Abby was the first dog that we trained. And in class, we were told to take our training outside of the classroom and go to a shopping center or train outside your house. And so um, I was following instructions, being the good student that I was. I had her ch um, a choke collar on her and her pinch collar on her, mm -hmm. two of those two collars. And we were working on healing, not loosely walking. <laughs> we were working on healing on the sidewalk of a shopping center. And as I was instructed to do, I was walking forward briskly and I made an immediate 180 turn and said heel. And she didn't come with me. So I yanked really hard as I was taught to do. And I looked back at her and I saw fear in her eyes. Mm -hmm. So she did what I'd ask, but I saw fear in her eyes. And so that was like, 
that maybe I didn't know it was fear at the time. I saw something that didn't look happy. And I thought, I'm not sure she likes this. You know, and then fast forward uh, to when we had our training center. I know we, I remember taking Abby to training classes. We get out of the car, start to go in and she would put on the brakes. We had to almost drag her into that facility. And then I remember one day sitting in our training center before class and people were pulling up into the parking lot. And when they got out, their dogs would literally drag them into the training center. And it was just, I thought, you know, they came in apologizing for their dogs are pulling. I said, don't apologize one bit. You know, your dog is excited <laughs> to be here and that makes me happy. Um, and the dog was happy to be in class where before eh, it's like when I went to school, I really didn't want to go in there. But now, you know, to see how dogs enter a properly run training class is a joy. So, you know, no matter what you're doing with your dog, whether you're sitting and watching TV or you're, you're working to, to help your dog learn something, it's really important to observe their body language and understand how they're feeling. You know, all, our goal if when working with students to help them learn this, and certainly we want our students to be comfortable with us and in, in the way we teach, right? We want our students and we want the dogs they're working with and the dogs we're working with, the dogs that live in our house, to feel physically and emotionally safe. That's first and foremost, because no creature um, can learn if they don't feel physically and emotionally safe. And um, that's true for people. That's true for dogs. That's cr true for, you know, any species. I'm always amazed at how resilient dogs are, though, and how forgiving they are. It, it, you know, you see these dogs that have been punitively trained and you see them like robots and you just or you see them walking along the street with all of the paraphernalia around the necks and they just they got that hung dog look and the, the owner's very happy because they it's got the remote control in their hand and they look, oh, look at my well-trained dog. And you just you look at that and you go, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that your human is doing this to you. Most of the time people are doing it because they're seduced by the uh, seductive marketing of punitive training or that it works and it's quick and it's a quick fix. But I was just, uh, first of all, I just apologize. Yes, I apologize to the dogs, but I'm always amazed at how you, you keep, you guys keep going. And, and so that's why I really like what you said, Brad, that the, that, that, your dog can follow you and be made to do things, but they're still going, if you're going to take them to training class and they don't like doing something, they might put the brakes on and they won't be excited about it. But when you are teaching dogs through fun and through play and through rewards and through just having a good time, then they, they pull to get into the training class. I mean, that your, your dog is just speaking volumes. Yeah. I've always said, you know, with the, old style of training, you can get compliance, but what you don't get is cooperation. Yeah. With positive training, you get a dog who's cooperative and is part of the game, part of the whatever, the plan, and is a willing participant uh, versus one who's just going along because they have to. So mm -hmm. here's here's something I shared with Brad not long ago. Um, and it's a, it's a very personal story, it's a very personal uh, story about a situation that occurred to us when we were early married. And I don't remember exactly what we were talking about at the time. Um, we were getting up, getting ready to go to work. Um, I had gotten out of the shower and the sh uh, it was a tub shower. And um, Brad was getting in second and he turned the water on and the shower hit him. I hadn't turned the shower part off to come through the tub faucet. And we were both in our corporate careers at that point in time. And I'm sure he was really stressed from his managerial career. And I was probably stressed from my work at IBM. But he, he it's probably one of, the few I yelled. <laughs> one of the few times in life. He yelled, cussed at me. He was very angry. And I, oh my gosh, it just, it, it, it affected me emotionally. I want you to know that for all the decades we've been married, up until last February, when we took our tub out and had a walk-in shower, <laughs> yeah. every time I got out of the shower, I, if I didn't do it immediately, it's like, oh my God, did I turn the shower head off? Mm. So that one 
really aversive moment in my life caused me to always turn the shower off. Mm. But it had an emotional consequence to it. It had a, a, a feeling that's like, ooh, I have, to, I have to do this or he'll be mad at me. He's mm. not going to be mad at me, right? A, a wonderful relationship. But how that one time caused emotional fallout in me. Yes, <laughs> to, to, to now you're, you still remember it to this I day. And I'm thankful that I don't have to think about that anymore <laughs> because I don't have to worry about that with our walk-in shower that only has a shower head. Isn't that wild? Yeah, that That's is wild. I think that that is so perfect. It's a story that illustrates learning so perfectly, like do you really want to teach your dog like that now, so that your dog is going to comply? Yeah. But yeah. So if Brad had shaped me over time to, and reinforced me for turning the shower head or the shower part off, I'd, I would have had a totally different emotional feeling about that. And it, and it just demonstrates how long that emotional feeling has stuck with you. Over 30 years. Yeah. Over 30 years. That's very powerful. There's something with something that happens every day in the life, right? You know, you're showering, yeah. bathing every day. So every day I thought of it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And we have an amazing. I didn't mean to be a jerk. No, he, I mean, I no. just got a on my head. I reacted. Yeah. Of course you did. You had the best relationship ever. Oh, I, I've done things. I've, you know, okay. It, living in England, our shower situations were so much different, right? We didn't shower, we bathed. And if we did shower, it was always with a handheld shower, okay? Well, that maybe that was my fan. But no, that was pretty typical of England. And so then I come to America and then you've got these shower baths where you can stand in the bath and then you can turn the shower on but in order for it not to come out of the faucet into the tub, you have to press something or pull something or turn something so that it comes out of the shower head instead. Well, I'd never grown up with that. I had no experience with that. So it was a learning thing for me. I didn't know what to do. I would have my bath um, or I would do a shower. And either way, he would get in and water would it would would be wrong right <laughs> and he would say what are you doing like do this this is how how many times do i have to tell you to do this i had not had any like i'd not grown up for him yeah. it was second nature i hadn't grown up with it yeah, you just didn't know what you didn't know so so your story resonates with me because it takes me back to and now it i didn't have as sort of it, it wasn't as intense as that but now still, I think I'm with you, Lisa. I'm like, whenever we go to a place is, oh, have I, have I turned it off so that when he gets in, the shower doesn't come out all at once and he'll come out of the faucet instead. I'm kind of with you. You've, you've really, you've triggered something in me now. It was, it was amazing when, you know, our re bathroom remodel was finished and I realized I didn't have to do that anymore. I said, hey, Brad, remember that story I told you about how that moment affected me? I never have to have that feeling again. Yeah. Inc and, incredible. And now have a positive reinforcement shower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, okay. Fast forward, you go through your education, you uh, run these amazing classes you're developing as trainers and then very fast forward to to VSA and now starting to, well, you've always educated a lot of people and trainers as well, but now working with VSA, educating the trainers of tomorrow. What is that like for you? For, I'll, I'll let Brad speak first. You know, for me, it sort of evolved about the same time I had made the conscious decision, kind of step back from training a little bit as far as training clients and their dogs in their home. And so VSA sort of came around at the same time. I thought, okay, I like this. This is good, good concept awesome. here. So for me, as opposed to helping one family and their dog, now I get to help, you know, future trainers who will go out and help hundreds or thousands of people and their dogs. So the, the ripple effect of what we're doing now, I think is what's most uh, reinforcing for me. Instead of helping one person, like I said, I get to help thousands. Um, the and the time. same with you, Lisa. I mean, uh, you know, 
And I, I think what is so wonderful is to see how students respond to you. Uh, you know, I, I think our love of nurturing people to learn a skill or learn, um, yeah, to learn a skill is what helps us be good teachers. I, there's nothing I love more than, than shaping a student's skills and their thoughts. I mean, we are, we are doing that, hopefully, and I tell my students in a way, if, I, if I'm giving you feedback, it's really to help you in, enhance your skills. And we, like we do with our dogs, right? We don't ever say, no, that's wrong. We, we shape them into doing and learning what's um, th the best practices, I guess I should say, no matter what that is, right? So it's, it's such a, a collaborative relationship with our students. I'm not the person who knows it all. I'm still learning. You know, I, the more I learn, the less I know. And and students oftentimes teach us things. Oh, always. Yeah. Always. Uh, so frequently. And uh, to me, that's the beauty of, of VSA, not to make a plug or anything, but every student is paired with a faculty advisor that they get to work with throughout the course and ask those questions of. And um, the faculty advisors are doing it because for the same reasons, they want to help spread the you know, world of dog training or the better world of dog training. Um, so it, it is hugely reinforcing. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. So we're going to continue doing it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> we don't want to lose you. No, 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 no. You continue as long as you can. Yeah. And so um, we're, you know, gosh, it's, you know, we knew that it was going to be a good ride with you all. We met, you know, Victoria and, and Van and I met early on, as Victoria alluded to earlier. And in our meeting, we just knew that we gelled together. So, and with uh, two people who also worked together, um, it's, you know, we've had fun working with VSA. We have fun with our students. We were, we're, making a difference in the dog training world and training the, the next generation of dog trainers. How can that not be awesome? It is awesome. And especially when you write an amazing book and have an amazing course, which you are going to be talking about at the Dog Behavior Conference Rocket Recall, we're going to take a quick break because I'd like to unpack or ask you a few questions about recall, which is I think one of the most important things to teach dogs, but we'll be back after this very short break. A quick break here to get a word from this episode's sponsor, the Victoria Stillwell Academy. Now, did you know that I have a school that teaches people to be dog trainers? I love It's Me or the Dog and my work as a dog trainer on television, but those of you who know me know that my true passion really lies with helping other people live their best lives with the dogs. And I love seeing that truly magical transformation when that light bulb goes off with someone I'm helping with their dog. That's what it's all about. It's the secret sauce that pet professionals like me, who work with these amazing animals, that's what we all share. It's what makes being a dog trainer the most rewarding, enriching job I can imagine. It's why I love what I do. And it's also why I founded the Victoria Stillwell Academy, so that I could provide a roadmap to others who want to help dogs and the people who love them learn to do what they love doing at the highest level, that is to become professional dog trainers. Earning a living working with dogs professionally has been a dream of mine for years. And that passion is what drives all of us at VSA to create courses that are specially designed to help adult human learners chase their dreams. Now, most people already know about our flagship dog trainer course, which provides both online only and in-person options. But did you know that we also offer both dog guardians and future professionals a fully refundable 10 hour online course taught by me and other awesome VSA faculty, and it's called the Fundamentals of Dog Training and Behavior course. Now, I know it's not the sexiest name, but it's one of the most dynamic learning experiences available to dog geeks, and it's a pretty awesome first step to see 
if learning with VSA is right for you. Now, as a Positively Podcast listener, you can use promo code PODCAST right now to get the fundamentals course for 50% off. That is $150 value. So, take our course. Plus, we also have a couple of free starter courses. They're free, completely free, including a course called Building Your Dog's Confidence, which reveals the secret ingredient to a happy dog life. So, I encourage you to check out VSA today. As I said, we have courses for all levels of learners. So it doesn't matter whether you're a newbie with your first puppy or a, or a grizzled vet already making a living as a pet professional. Visit Positively.com slash VSA to learn more and enroll in a free course. That is Positively.com slash VSA. We all want the best for our dogs. Whether that means you taking home some key tips for your own dogs or adding the ultimate in professional dog trainer education. Visit Positively.com slash VSA today. VSA, it is the future of dog training. And now, back to the podcast. I'm back with Lisa and Brad Wagner. And they are going to be presenting at the Dog Behavior Conference, which I am very excited about on Rocket Recall. This is, you have the most amazing book. Uh, Very fortunate for any dog lover out there, for any dog trainer out there who wants to learn. Writing a book is a big deal. What, What made you think about writing about this particular subject? Um, it, the catalyst for the book came at the conclusion of one of our off-leash play groups that we used to hold for our dog training clients. So once a month, we used to hold um, a session where people who'd been through our basic manners class could come out to our property in our fenced area, bring their dogs to have a play session. And my dog, Willow, um, who, if, if you're a VSA student, you've seen her in the, the course curriculum, my dog, Willow, Over the course of the hour, I recalled her several different times from playing with dogs or from a situation or one situation or another. And as I was walking one of the clients to the gate to leave, he said, how did you do that? Hmm. And I said, well, you just you train it. But I didn't really think about how I trained it. So we were doing recall classes. We started doing recall um, Workshops. workshops. And so I started, you know, writing down my formula um, of the way I package things to put them together to to make a um, um, a protocol to to teach a reliable, uh, not just recall, but a recall with speed, so the dog turns on a dime and bounds rapidly to you. So it was that um, we did a Tazer DVD. They um, produced a DVD now streaming about. 12, 10 or 12 years ago, but I always wanted to write a book. People like to, to, to hold and read. Um, and in the process of writing another book, a memoir about my dog training years and the way my dogs have changed my life, I was writing some very difficult, about some very difficult moments in my life. And I said, I've got to have a, br- a break from this work. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, this is a good time to write my book on recall. And it took me nine months, but I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I expected to ha- have it done in two or three months, you know, I should, <laughs> yeah, no, that never happens. First, yeah. first time mm-hmm. author, no, not going to happen. Um, but you know, I was really pleased that I got it done in about nine months. Um, but I've been very just overjoyed to know, um, the response I've had from dog guardians and dog trainers alike. Um, so the the book evolved into some trainers emailing me and saying, have you ever thought about making these exercise exercises available to trainers to use? I like, no, I did not. So um, so now we have the Rocket Recall Instructors Handout Kit. Um, I'm developing a, a Rocket Recall online uh, course, self-paced online course. Hopefully that will be done mid-April. Maybe I think it's just like the book. It's taking a little <laughs> bit longer than you anticipate. Like, oh, it'll be that easy. Um, so yes, I'm really p- pleased that 
um, the community has embraced um, the methodology that we've been using for a lot of years with clients. Can you tell me some essential ingredients needed to have a rocket recall? Do you want to you want to take that? I can talk about one. Yeah. It's one that we in dog training now starting to come up more and more, and that's about relationship. Um, and it was an epiphany. Ep- one more time. A realization I just had. <laughs> um, to that, the power of the relationship. For my whole dog training career, I had my guy, Cody. And I lost him this summer. But I had a 14 and a half year relationship with him. Mm. And other dogs, uh, Willow and Kaylee had come through and Lisa did all the work with them. And I kind of worked with Cody and she had awesome recalls with Willow and Kaylee. And I had an awesome recall with Cody. But when I would call one of the other two dogs, they would come, but not with the same enthusiasm as when Lisa called and vice versa. Now we're down to a single dog. So I'm spending more time with Keaton than I ever did with the other two. And now I realize that his recall to me is just about as good as it is with Lisa. And I'm thinking, well, this dog kind of likes me. I'm going, wait, we have a relationship now. We actually, I've actually spent time with him and that alone with the training, of course, but that has been the biggest part of that recall. So, you know, and you can liken it to if your best friend or spouse calls to you, you're probably going to respond quicker than if some stranger or somebody you really don't care for calls for you. So you know, that realization that it's about relationship as much as anything else, you still have to train it, go through the steps and help the dog understand the, you know, the process, but they got to like you. <laughs> yeah. And so I think the, the, the reason the, the protocol that, that we've developed has been successful is because we have broken it down into easily achievable parts for both the human and the dog. The, the most challenging piece, I think, of, of anything we teach our dogs is moving from a no distraction area or no distraction situation to one that's very distracting. And most people don't really understand that. So you train something at home and it's brilliant at home. And then you go to the park and it falls apart. It doesn't work. And it's like, my dog should know that. Well, he shouldn't, right? Um if we, I've never had children, but I think it's similar to if you want your child to eat out with you, then you're going to need to practice in, you know, taking them out to, to dinner in places that maybe are more intimate before it's a big crowd and the distractions and the child has to focus on what's right in front of them. You started a fast food restaurant before you go to the five star <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think I, I've, I've been told and have been been reinforced by people saying, "I really love the fact that I I have the steps mm-hmm. um, to break things down and move slowly with specific techniques into um, each um, increasing level of distraction and giving you you know how to do that." Now, I think dogs are pretty good at like people. I always, when anybody calls me, even when Vag calls me or anything, I'm like, hey, just a minute. How do you, I think dogs are good at saying, hey, just a minute, especially when they're, they're smelling a smell or they are playing with somebody. They're like, yeah, okay, hold on. But you want, let's say for safety, how do you, how do you, stop that just a minute how do you kind of get like oh immediately when i say you you've got to come to me good question you want to practice it so much just like van he doesn't have to think (laughs) when he plays guitar anymore right it just just comes right out of his fingers he practices so much that there's muscle memory he doesn't have to think about doing it um when you're driving a car we all drive a car um, maybe not always drive a stick shift, but we drive a car and when there, we see a brake light ahead of us, we don't think, okay, what do I need to do now? Do I, oh, I need to take my foot off the accelerator. I need to move it to the left. I need to press down on the brake with sufficient pressure in order to stop myself so I don't hit the car in front of me. That's automatic. Playing guitar is automatic for Van. 
driving a car for all of us is automatic. We don't have to think about that. But do you re- can you even remember when we all started driving cars? That took a lot of thought. And where did we start driving first? Probably in our neighborhood, you know, where the streets weren't trafficked and then graduated into more traffic and more distractions. So it's repetition, 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 and practice, practice, practice. And because it's such an easy thing to do around home, your dog gets reinforced every single time they practice. And reinforcement does what? Drives behavior upwards. So yes, um, it's, it's, and what, what else happens when you're practicing a lot? You're building a relationship together. So you can build your relationship through very simple exercises that you can do starting in your home and then on your property and around your house long before you go somewhere else. So yeah, we want, we want recall to be automatic. And Brad has a great story about Cody when, with Cody's recall being automatic. It was, it's one of those red letter dates that you keep in your head forever and ever. I could show you exactly where out in the pasture I was, where he was. It was one of those, we'd been working on it. And I thought, let's just try to proof this a little bit. Let's see where we are. And he was maybe 50 yards away sniffing the ground and I gave my recall cue and I can see it right. His body started moving. His legs started moving before his nose ever left the ground. He was already starting to respond to the recall cue. Um, I'll carry that picture with me forever. I mean, and he came running and we had a big time and then released him to go play again. But that one, he was still sniffing when his body was already his, you know, his nose was saying, wait just a minute, but his body was saying, got to go. Um, <laughs> and again, that's, you know, that's automatic. It's, it's, and it's because at the end of the call, right at the end of the behavior, when Cody returned to Brad, something fun happened. You know, we're all, if we're being reinforced with something we do, we're going to work harder to attain that reinforcer, whatever that reinforcer is. And it didn't always end the fun just because he came to me. Doesn't yeah. mean we were going to get in the car, go back in the house, you know, he gets to go place more, you know, got a bit of food and take off smelling again. So, yeah, but that one day, I can't remember the date, but I can show you the exact place that it happened. It's uh, It's like poetry in motion when the dog gets it. And, you know, I, I always see training as a dance when you're first learning something. You're going to tread on each other's toes. Probably you're going to make mistakes. That's okay. But man, when it happens, it is like a waltz and it and feels that, so good. And that again is the relationship, you know, a different dance. You may waltz beautifully. I don't waltz so beautifully, but somebody else may. But if you've never danced together, then it is going to be awkward in the beginning until you get to know one another well. And then it is truly a dance. And that is wonderful to see it happen. Yeah. I was telling Brad this morning, um, two things. One, in my book, there are the, there are the, the recall training exercises, but then before you get to that, there are some foundation exercises to train. And, and I call those, you know, focus and attention exercises. But because of those early foundation exercises, because I've done that with Keaton, when he's out with Brad or, or by himself and I walk out, I don't even have a chance to call him. I can't even get his recall cue out because the moment he sees me, he's running toward me. Mm. So, you know, in that sense, I am the reinforcer. He's coming to me because of all the good stuff that's happened with me previously. Um, Could be food, could be play. It could be I'm going to run and let him chase me. And so, yeah, it's just amazing that that happens. And so as I was walking with Keaton by myself around the pasture this morning, on a very cold winter morning, I was just thinking about that. Like it's, it's just so amazing to have him never want to be too far from me. So I never have to recall him from very far. And I came up with the analogy that like this way of teaching recall is like my dog gets to go to grandma's house. So what's grandma's house for a child? It's where the fun stuff happens. Grandma spends time with the grandchild, they're doing fun stuff together, they're building a relationship. 
And the child in some way, shape or form is getting reinforced, whether that's play or grandma's cooking something awesome or feeding ice cream when the child doesn't get that at home. But so, you know, the dog goes to grandma's house. <laughs> I love that. I think that's the perfect analogy for it. It's perfect. Unless I have to say going to my grandmother's house was maybe a bit different in the fact that I loved my reinforcer was the fact that she was, she bred beagles. And so <sighs> there were puppies there. She was a very good breeder and she bred for the love of the breed and the betterment of the breed. Um, and, and so that was my reinforcement going to my grandmother's house. But my grandmother was also quite a scary lady <laughs> as in she was very strict. So, um, but she made me flapjacks and I loved flapjacks and that was a thing. And then also I did these, um, you're very close. It's a place called Turville and they used to have, um, for anybody who's seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, it's filmed all around Hambledon and Turville. It's kind of a place where I, I spent a lot of my childhood and, um, we did a lot of courses on horses. <laughs> we spent a, a week with a horse and we would learn all about it. And so, and I was a pretty good rider. And so going to, going to granny's house was not just, dogs it was flapjacks it was uh, evenings by the fire and it was riding horses but she was kind of she was a very strict lady i have to say then and this uh, just reminded me of this story which is maybe a bit off topic but again you, you trigger things in me lisa i, I kind of remember <laughs> things she taught me something really important my grandmother so i i was i was at a doing um one of the week week long horse riding courses and I had come back and I, she was, I think, in the garden doing something. And I had in the hallway was a very lovely lamp. And I had walked, I had just, I think I changed out of my clothes upstairs. I'd come down the stairs. I walked past this lamp and I think something like my elbow must have brushed it anyway. This lamp falls off the table and it breaks the bulb doesn't break but the lamp breaks and so i'm like oh my god what am i gonna do my grandmother's gonna see this oh my god i can't tell her and I, well, i'm about like what 12 at this point and so i pick up the lamp and i put it back on the table and i kind of like put it together as best as i can and try and hide it so that she's not going to see the fact that the lamp base is broken. Anyway, the next day, thank goodness she doesn't see that night. And the next day when I come back, we're in the car and she says, um, do you have anything to tell me? And I went like, no. And she said, um, did anything happen with the lamp in the hallway? And I went, nope. I don't know. Nope. And she said, um, she said, I'm going to give you another chance, another. <laughs> <laughs> Did anything happen with the lamp? And I went, uh, yes, it did. I, I was like, I was just an accident and I'm so sorry. I walked past it and I think my elbow brushed it and it came on. I thought you'd be really angry. And she said, no, no, no. She said, if you'd have told me the truth, I wouldn't be angry. But you didn't feel like you could come to me and tell me what had happened. And she said, that makes me more upset than angry. And I said to her, well, sometimes she said, why didn't you want to tell, tell me that? I said, well, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed that I'd broken this because I know that it's quite an expensive lamp. And she said to me, she said, um, and I said, and sometimes you can be scary, Granny. <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed. And I think from then on, we were like, oh, we were on much better footing. But she, she taught me an important lesson. And I think I also taught her an important lesson. Sure, yes. That if I think if I trusted her more and I felt like I wasn't going to, you know, she wasn't going to be oh, upset with me or that, that, Maybe I would have told her about the lamp. Maybe I'd have had the confidence to say, oh, look what I did. Yeah. But no, I tried to hide it. And I learned an important lesson too about telling the truth and owning up to something. Even when it is, you know, it makes you, it, it makes you feel bad about yourself or, you know, you did something. I didn't mean to break that lamp. No, no. And, and yeah, 
it was an important lesson for both of you. And I'm sure, you know, she, evidently it seems like she didn't realize that you perceived her as being so strict. Um, it's like we didn't realize at the time that our, we were scaring our dog. No. You know, yeah. We were doing the old fashioned way. And Brad so, didn't realize that his yelling at me you know, with the shower <laughs> thing that, you know, right. was going to affect me that way. Um, and on any other day, it may not have been, you know, I don't remember exactly, you know, what we were feeling at the time, but yeah. But it stays with us. Honestly, we we, yes, we remember still- that, don't we? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's classically conditioned. So that's why right. it's so important that we think about it before we enter into any relationship human or canine, whatever, that how are, how will I be perceived to this dog, to this person? How can I make that dog or person feel safe in my presence? And then everything else after that should go pretty smoothly. Well, it won't always go smoothly, but you have a better chance of you know, the outcome that you desire. And honesty in a relationship, you know, honesty between, you know, both people, Trainer and client, trainer dog, client dog, you know, and predictability, you know, um, and maybe that's one of the things that was so difficult all those years ago that that was a very unpredictable situation with Brad. That did, he, I mean, he's the easiest going, most wonderful yeah. guy, and I've never seen him or or heard him say anything like that. So. Yeah, all of that. Um, we want dogs and people, no matter who they are, whether we're working with them or interacting with them in some way, shape or form. We want, you know, everybody needs to feel physically, emotionally safe. And that's the paramount importance. That's why we have the Harmony model where safety and wellness is at the top of that. It, it is. It, it's a very important component. And, and I've literally just before recording this podcast, I was speaking to um, some clients and saying that the, the that it's fine for you to manage your environment so that your dogs are safe, but they've got to feel safe, too. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. unless you can create that environment, then you're still going to have difficulties and these dogs are not going to learn. Because you're not creating, you're keeping them in a state of stress, state of chronic stress, really, and they're not. And, and learning cannot take place. Yep. If these dogs don't feel safe around each other, uh, before we before we go, can you give some of our listeners, those of you who are going to register for the Dog Behavior Conference, a, a little bit of a taster about what you're going to talk about? Sure. Hmm. You know. I, We're certainly going to talk about some of the steps that are important in the original rocket recall. But I think I think the overarching theme of what we're going to talk about is is how you these steps built build a bond of trust and an affection with the dog in front of you. So. And you're going to have an awesome recall. Your dog is going to come back to you by following these techniques. But you can, you can rejuvenate a lost relationship. We have a client of ours. Um, I mean, this is one of those, oh, my God, moments with a client who had spent eight years using aversive techniques with her dog. Her dog would comply. But her dog wanted nothing to do with her if it was outside of a training relationship, which she didn't have an aversive tool on the dog. So she started taking our classes and took our, our recall class. And in a short period of time, Sirius, her dog, instead of wanting nothing to do with her when she walked away, wanted to hang out near her. So he wanted to spend time with her and he would come back to her when she called, which wasn't the case before. Wow. So it's about using techniques to train uh, a recall with rocket like speed with techniques that also help you nourish your relationship and feed your soul and also feed your dog's soul. Yeah. 
Thank you, Lisa and Brad, for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you for agreeing to present at the DBC too. I'm really excited. And I would say you've got to run, don't walk to register for the Dog Behavior Conference, everybody. It is April the 19th to the 21st, three days of just incredible presentations, incredible learning. And as Lisa said, even though we've been at this a long time, we're still learning. And I think we love learning. I know that I love learning. I know that I love geeking out and finding this. Oh, there's been a new study. Wow. Now I'm going to read all about this. And oh my gosh. Or I listen to somebody speak and I go, oh, I really, I've learned something new today. You never stop, do you? No, you never stop. You no, know, even if it's on a topic and that I've heard a hundred times before, hearing someone different maybe present it might hear a different way of something else might be said that makes it tweaks it just that little bit more um, so it's always i enjoyed the conference last year we weren't presenting but i you know sat through every single presentation and i walked away smarter yeah, yeah there's there's always something to learn and um science changes you know the, the way even though we've been positive reinforcement trainers for all this time you and brad and i our techniques have changed over time there are things we did 15 20 years ago that were still kind of under the r, r, r plus umbrella positive reinforcement umbrella but boy have we nuanced what we've done so that um we first and foremost always have the the client and the dog's physical and emotional safety you know first at hand that's it. The most important thing. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I good. knew that you would enjoy this podcast, everybody, because Lisa and Brad are truly wonderful. And if people want to know more about you and about how to, about Cold Nose College, where would they go? They can find us at coldnosecollege.com. They can find us on Facebook and they can email us, Lisa at coldnosecollege.com or Brad at coldnosecollege.com. And so I can just see, I, I can see Keaton's nose peeking in there. Oh, he's right here. Yeah, <laughs> he right is there. just, oh my gosh. And yeah. talk about relationship. For those of you who can't see, dog. Keaton is now, he is, he's, he's an Australian shepherd. He's so handsome and he's now sitting on Lisa's lap. <laughs> and he's like, I love you so much. If he could find us a good dog trainer, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. And then he, the way he looked at you, Brad, too. Wow, that's relationship. Yeah, it's really it awesome to see the relationship between these two. Yeah. It's pretty cool. He's a pretty awesome puppy. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you, too, for listening to the podcast. I always have the best guests on here. And I can't wait to see you all again next week. Take care, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Victoria Stillwell's Positively Podcast. For Victoria's online dog training courses, more information, and helpful dog training tips, visit Victoria's official website at Positively.com. Get connected on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media as Victoria Stillwell, and follow her on Twitter at Victoria S. Learn to become a professional dog trainer with the Victoria Stillwell Academy at VSDogTrainingAcademy.com. And be sure to tune in next time as Victoria helps you and your dog live your best life together, positively. Positively.